And we're back. Greetings, everyone. This is Lucian Vonsan, broadcasting from Cluj-Napoca, Transylvania. As always, alongside with me is Herr Jon Gunnarsson, broadcasting from Deutschland, and our producer, James Huff, making sure everything works just fine, broadcasting from the US. Greetings, Mr. Gunnarsson. Good evening. How's it going? How did the um, ICMI, ICMI in London go? The ICMI itself went just fine. The rest of, the, of, of it was awful. I mean, the, the Londonese food is awful. The weather is awful. <laughs> <laughs> the transportation system is awful. Should I go on? <laughs> yeah, but I mean... Yeah, it was all right. Go, go to London for the weather or for the food. Yeah, fair enough, fair enough. Who the hell goes to London for the food, actually? Uh, but yeah... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, all of that aside, it was completely worth it, although I had to travel for like three hours and a half to reach from the airport to the venue uh, because, you know, the air companies, they, they, they say London on a ticket, but they actually land in the Luton airport, which is quite far from, <laughs> uh, from uh, where the conference took place, which was right next to the financial district, you know, right there in the most white mm -hmm. capitalist area of London. <laughs> So yeah, but yeah, the the, the conference was was far, far better than I expected, and you know, uh, the speakers held uh, held on point. Nobody went over time. No protesters, or even if there were, we couldn't see them because the security was excellent. So yeah, well, that, that, that's that's a disappointment. There's no protesters. Yeah, Steve Brule was the most was a bit was the most disappointed individual at the conference. You know, he traveled all the way from Canada to videotape protesters. So <laughs> he was the most disappointed of all. Yeah, so maybe the feminists are actually learning. Yeah, maybe. Although uh, during the conference, Facebook took down uh, our Facebook page, uh, and uh, you know, we said that at the conference, and uh, then. A guy from Breitbart interviewed me, and I said that, well, given the Marxism, feminism within Facebook, um, it was totally uh, expected for them to eventually do so. Uh, and guess what? Two hours later, Facebook uh, suspended my own like, Facebook account <laughs> 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 for defamation. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, I guess they they, they still took, um, held an eye on the on the whole thing in a way or not. Yep. Now, other than that, uh, oh yeah, the, there was a funny Norwegian guy at the conference who <clears throat> was fishing for everyone who speaks Norwegian and Swedish, saying, "Oh, I want to make a Nordic conference, but I want to make it in Norwegian and Swedish and not in English because the Finns can't keep up with their Swedish classes." <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, we had quite a lot of fun. Now, now, obviously, as I predicted before the conference, I spent at least half of the socializing time with Karen because we were the only two chain smokers in there. <laughs> so, yeah. All right. Should we get into the news? Uh, yeah, I, I think we should. But hopefully it will get colder because at least in, in London I hated the wind, but the temperature was okay. But in here there is no wind and the temperature is 30. <laughs> so, so there's that. Uh, okay, yeah, speaking of Norway, let's get to the first one coming from Berdenskong. Uh, this is very interesting. When men come out worse. And it goes like this. It's written by the leader of the Labour, Norwegian Labour Party, the deputy head of the Labour Party, and the member of the parliament for the Labour Party. It goes like this. It is not okay that boys fall after school, they have a higher suicide risk, or that they do not get the time with their children as they would wish, or they die four years earlier than women. We're fooling ourselves if we think it brings us forward to close our eyes to men's equality challenges. When Emma and Emil are born, Emma gets to wear a pink jumpsuit, whilst Emil gets a blue one. In kindergarten, Emma is sweet, whilst Emil is a tough little robber. At school, Emma gets praise because she does her homework so carefully. Emil gets to be shut up because he cannot sit still. In high school, Emma gets honors, and afterwards she will sail through medical school. The majority of the people she studies with are girls. Emil, however, is struggling with the grades and drops out after two years of high school. Emil is more po sorry, more prone to substance, substance abuse, abuse or alcohol problems and has nearly three times as high suicide risk as Emma. If he has a child and separates from his wife or girlfriend, there are only uh, seven or eight percent chances that the, child, that the children will live permanently with him. 
if he has children at all, for more and more men remain childless. Emma and Emil are, of course, fictional. They are obviously not representative of all of the same sex as them, but they are examples of trends that should worry us. Skipping a bit. We know that boys struggle more than girls in school. They get lower grades and their dropout rate in secondary education is far higher. To a greater extent than in previous times, the, the, these differences persist. Fewer boys than girls complete higher education in the prescribed time, and in recent years, men have lost their jobs far more often than women, and the proportion of part-time jobs amongst men has increased. In many, area, in many of the areas, we have the numbers, but we know less about the causes and solutions. Labour will have surveyed the, the situation of men in Norway today, so we get a knowledge-based uh, foundation to grab the men's challenges. Where we lack knowledge, we cannot insert accurate measures. We proposed this when the Parliament dealt with the government's equality strategy. Our proposal was voted down. But while we wait for the other parties to understand that it is both women's and men's interest to find out more about why men fare worse in some areas and what we can do about it, there is much we can do already now. We can make sure that uh, your gender matters less already from uh, when you're tiny. A gender equality must become a more central issue in kindergartens and a male must get the more male role models in the nurseries. Opposition instructed our government to step up efforts to get more men into kindergartens. We are also in request we sorry, we have also requested that kindergarten children must be given more education about body, identity and emotions. Maybe this would make it easier for Emil to be confident in themselves and his choices. Skipping a bit more and it ends with it is not okay that boys fall after school, that they have a higher suicide risk, or that they do not get the time with the, their children as they would wish, or that, that they die four years earlier than women. We are repeating ourselves, but we are fooling ourselves if we think it brings us forward to close our eyes to the men's equality challenges. <clears throat> now, this is interesting, coming from the, from the Social Democrats, basically, the, the Labour Party. Yeah, very interesting indeed. Um... What I would say is that uh, one problem I see here is that it's a bit too focused on just pointing out uh, statistical inequalities in outcome, which mm -hmm. may not be due to any sort of discrimination or societal problems or anything. Um, mm -hmm. may, maybe higher suicide rates uh, are not because of uh, discrimination, but just because of... Um, maybe some sort of innate difference between men and women or different choices men and women make. Um, so just pointing out the differences in numbers is not enough to establish uh, uh, some sort of discrimination. Mm -hmm. um, but of course it is uh, very telling that uh, when, it, when it goes the other way around these kinds of numbers are always trotted out to, to support uh, supposed discrimination against women with the wage gap and uh, things like that. Yeah, well, once uh, the portions that I skipped from this article, they actually mentioned the wage gap as a legit thing. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, mm -hmm. there's that. So at least they're being consistent. That is to say, consistently wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, at least if you have to, if if you want to 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 use that approach, at least you have to use it in a sort of balanced way. Uh, because if if you if you look at all the ways in which women are doing worse and ignore all the ways in which they are doing better, then of course you're always going to get uh, uh, this idea that women are being oppressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, with regards to the suicide point, I, I really don't know. I, I thought about it and I haven't reached any conclusion. It may indeed be true that it has nothing to do with the uh, as you said, societal problems and whatnot, it may indeed be due to innate differences, maybe. However, why did in the 50s or 40s the suicide rate, you know, in the peace times, I mean, in the war period, it was already obviously higher um, amongst men than amongst women, but in peace time, you know, in the 50s and 60s, suicide rate uh, differences between men and women was far smaller than it is now. Yep. Why was that the case? I actually don't know. It's uh, I don't know that I don't know that either. I, mean, I, th I thought about it, and the, the suicide thing is a very interesting uh, issue to to explore because I don't think anyone even has the answers as to why. Yeah, it's definitely a very interesting question that's worth exploring. Now we we have to give them a little bit of a credit for the Arbeidsparti in Norway. I mean, they're they're approaching this from a 
left-wing collectivist statist perspective. So, you know, even when they get it wrong, at, at least they're starting to ask some real questions. Yeah, definitely. I was maybe a bit too critical. I mean, it was sort of uh, trying to find uh, mm -hmm. uh, some sort of flaw with it, but it's really overall a very good article. And mm -hmm. I'm very glad that uh, something like that comes out of Norway and from the uh, from the left wing of Norway at that. Yeah, to be fair, the the right uh, that is now uh, the Progress Party, which is the right wing party of Norway, uh, has been uh, uh, quite consistent in tackling men's issues. I mean, they they forced uh, uh, state organizations to actually provide you know domestic violence shelters for men too. And the private organizations that were getting funds from the state were told that either you're going to provide for men too, or you'll lose the state funding. Uh, and they actually enforced it, and without too much of a fuss, like it happened in England, where they keep on postponing it, even though the law's been on the books for <laughs> three years now. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in fairness, the right in Norway has been uh, much more advanced in tackling men's issues than I, than I would even argue anyone anyone else in Europe. I mean, let's not forget that in Europe uh, there are what three countries that sponsor uh, uh, domestic violence shelters for men. One is Norway, one is Turkey, believe it or not, and one is the Netherlands. Yeah, I mean that's that's definitely a very good sign, and it's especially hopeful when uh, when it's both people on the left and on the right who are picking up on these issues because that mm -hmm. is really where you uh, that really has to be the goal. Because if uh, if men's issues just become something that is associated with the right, then it's something that uh, all people on the left will then start to oppose, and uh, then then you have this uh, situation where you only maybe you know half half the time you get uh, some sort of uh, progress on these issues, and then when the other party is in power, then uh, that gets reversed again. Uh, whereas if if it's both uh, sides who are supporting it at least to some extent, then that's uh, much much better. Indeed, and you know, Paul used to say uh, several years ago that we, if we get the Republicans and Democrats to argue with each other how to make things better for men, that's when we win. And it would appear that this is starting to happen in Norway, much faster yeah, the, than, than anyone expected. And the, the problem is if, if, if you're just uh, someone who is... Uh, if if, uh, if men's issue just becomes a right-wing thing, then uh, people on the right can uh, can start to take us for granted because then we're going to, mm -hmm. to vote for them uh, for them anyway, and they don't really have to give us much. They just have to throw us a bone every now and then. Whereas mm -hmm. if it's actually something that the people on the left are also competing for, for our votes, uh, for our support, uh, then we can actually get things done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, competition makes things better even in politics. Uh, now, one more thing is that the, uh, this would have been quite unimaginable two years ago. If you remember when we read that article about that 16-year-old girl who was cursed and chastised by all the feminists in Norway for daring to say that maybe we shouldn't have our March 8th uh, you know, march uh, focused on prostitution because not, anyone, not everyone agrees with the um, hardline puritanical line on, on prostitution. Those were most of the time labor, you know, Arbeitsparty at feminists. Uh, so it was unimaginable at the time that just two years later the the Labour Party in Norway would come out with something like this. Because let's not forget that after this article, they actually include it in their election manifesto. So they'll they'll run with it. Yeah, it's almost too good to be true. Yeah, and I, I would suspect, and I don't know this for sure. I, I I've written to my Norwegian friends, and I still haven't got any answer to the uh, uh, commencement of this show. So maybe by next week I'll have some answers. But I would, I would, I am to presume that this is happening because uh, quite a few hardline feminists pretty much left the Labour Party to join the Norwegian version of feminist initiative, uh, or join the, their traditional far left uh, party, the Venstre. Yeah, I mean, I mean, maybe with the people on the far far left, we can't really win. But at least if if we get the mainstream left, that is really good enough. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I don't think so either. I mean, I, I said that at, at the conference that non-feminist ideas can be as non-partisans to the extent that we ignore the far left. <laughs> I mean, the center-left people can be quite reasonable uh, in many regards, but uh, with the far left, I don't think we'll ever be able to win. Yeah, I don't. I don't think we even need to. I mean, I somehow doubt that there will ever be a far left uh, communist-style political party 
be voted on en masse uh, in Europe anytime soon. I mean, even the uh, even the Syriza party in uh, in Greece isn't really that far left when compared to the Norwegian far left. Yep. Okay. Should right. we go on? Yeah, let's go to the next one. Going a little bit south from Norway to the Republic of Ireland, coming from the Irish Examiner. Three-year sentence for false rape claim. A judge yesterday imposed a three-year prison term on a woman who sparked a needless six-week-long pursuit for a rapist around Shaman. The investigation, which included Gardai making 30 separate house calls in Shaman, uh, Co. Claire followed uh, Amanda Hayes falsely reporting to Gardai, that would be the police, that she was raped by a man wearing a hoodie in the early hours of St. Stephen's Day in December 2014 at Drungely in Shaman. In her complaint to Gardai, Mrs. Heiss, age 26, of uh, Ines Igla, Shannon, gave a graphic account of the supposed rape. In sentencing, uh, Ms. Hayes, uh, to the three years uh, of uh, which the final 18 months are suspended, Judge Gerald Keyes told the uh, uh, sorry, Ennis Circuit Court yesterday that the mother of two, that through her false report, had, had subjected people who were interviewed by Gardai as part of the investigation to damage and hurt. Asked uh, was she raped, Miss Hayes replied no. Asked why she reported the rape, she replied, I don't know what I said, I really don't, I'm sorry for what I said. Mark Nicholas, defending, said that Miss Hayes' false allegation uh, was uh, born out of addiction rather than malice, and that she did not make a complaint against any named individual. Now this is very interesting. Again, two or three years ago, <laughs> actually going to jail even for half of the sentence, because half of it is quote-unquote suspended, actually going to jail for false rape uh, allegations wasn't really thinkable in Ireland. Mr. Gunnarsson? Uh, you got to be fucking kidding me. Oh, excuse me, excuse me, I was muted, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, as I just said, it was a uh, surprisingly harsh sentence, and uh, it's uh, definitely a good sign that uh, false rape accusations are, are finally being taken very seriously. Yeah, I, I don't know if it was really that harsh. I mean, I, I, it's basically 18 months, uh, because half of it was suspended. Yeah, I'm not saying that it's too harsh, but it, it, it seems like a, a very uh, reasonable sentence. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it is. All right. Let's get to the next one. Oh, just the next one is on Deutsch. Okay, the next one is from Deutschland, exactly, from uh, RP Online. Judges Association says stricter sex crime law will lead to problems. On Thursday, the Bundestag passed a bill to tighten law uh, concerning sexual offenses. The German Judges Association predicts many problems with the practical implementation of the reform. Trials where a no by the victim will be enough to sentence a sex offender were complicated. Uh, Jens Gnieser, chairman of the Judges Association, told the Neue Osnabrücker Zeitung. Quote, these trials will be tough to handle because there are just uh, two contradictory testimonies without any further evidence, Knisser argued. After all, such an offense would have to be committed without any resistance or violence. Otherwise, it would be a rape. However, he is in principle in favor of strengthening the principle of uh, sexual autonomy. The public needs to be aware, he said, that this reform would likely not lead to a significant increase in convictions. On Friday, in the last week before the summer break, the Bundestag strengthened the rights of the victims of sex offenses. The German Judges Association is the professional association of judges and public prosecutors in Germany and has more than 16,000 members. So basically this was the shortest article I could find about this, uh, this topic. Um, we've talked about it in, in the past when they were uh, contemplating um, passing this new law that, that supposedly means that now no means no in, in Germany. Um, of course, it also means a couple of other things too. Um, and it was just uh, you know, recently, what was it, last week, uh, passed um, uh, in the Bundestag um, and was actually passed uh, unanimously. Um, not a single dissenter there. 
Um, it still has to pass in the Bundesrat, which is uh, where the uh, separate uh, German states, separate Bundesländer are represented. But it's uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it's of, of course also very likely to pass there. So um, there's a law that is going to come. Um, if I remember correctly, this was the the bill that in, in introduced like forced kissing as a as a jailable offense. Am, am, am I correct, or am I or is my yeah, memory? yeah, basically all, all sorts of things like that. Uh, for example, in, the, in one of these, uh, there was one uh, column that we read uh, or that I read a couple of uh, was a couple of months ago uh, by a German judge who said that you know uh, with this uh, new law. Um, if or basically under, under the existing law, if you um, if say you, you know a woman and uh, she she loans you her new car and you then go on and uh, uh, purposefully wreck the car and uh, set it on fire and then um, you, you when you return the keys uh, to her you and she asks where the car is you uh, you you um, curse her you call her all sorts of names and then you punch her in the face. And then, when she's lying on the on the ground, you you piss on her. Um, if you do that, the the maximum sentence you'll get is uh, uh, one year in jail. But uh, if you uh, instead grab her butt, that then you can get up to what is it, two or three years in jail. So maybe not the most reasonable types of uh, of, uh, of of sentencing length. Yeah, whatever happened to the uh, punishment must, must fit the crime principle. Yeah. Also, also there's uh, some some other very questionable things in, in there. So, for example, if uh, um, so, if you're you're part of a group of people who is uh, committing some sort of um, uh, uh, sexual um, sexual offense, some sort of um, sexual harassment or whatever. Um, then you are now guilty, even if you do not actually participate in the crime, and you know, and you're not actually an accomplice. That is, you don't actually um, help in any way with the crime. It's just, uh, it's just sufficient that you are a part of some sort of group of people um, where some of the members are committing this kind of crime. That is enough to to now be be, uh, be yourself uh, considered uh, considered a criminal. Which is in terms scary. of the constitutionality of that is it's quite uh, it's quite dubious and um, yeah I was I was about to ask how constitutional that can be I mean it, it it's guilt by association it is a bit scary yeah I mean they were in, in the in the Bundestag in the debate about that uh, law a couple of people from uh, I think mostly from the Greens and from the left party from the opposition um, complained about about that part of the law. But uh, in the end, it was left in there, and they still voted for it. So yeah. I mean, <laughs> let's suppose that I am, you know, from a, the society of long-haired men that has, I don't know, a hundred members, and you know, whilst I'm not even on the same continent with the rest of the society, I don't know, five members decide to organize themselves and gang rape a chick. Uh, how are the rest of the 95 members, even if, even so, even those who weren't even on the same continent when the crime occurred, could they even possibly be? No, no, it it, it doesn't work like that. It has to, it has to be some sort of uh, group that is like physically there. It's not just some some sort of organization you belong to. But if you, I know you're going out with a group of uh, 10 friends and then uh, you're at some bar, say, and then. Uh, some of some of your friends start to to harass a woman. Even if you're not actually participating, you might still be uh, guilty of a crime. Then that's still insane. Yep. I mean, it, it pretty much negates the individual autonomy of the actual offenders. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's one thing if if you're uh, some sort of accomplice, if you're uh, shielding off the the uh, the actual perpetrators from. Uh, from the view of the public, you're doing this consciously, and uh, and uh, yeah, but that's what you're going to accomplish. That's a different yeah, thing. Or you're, you're you're lying to protect them or something like that. that then, mm -hmm. of course, that's that's fine. That that that's uh, punishable by law. But uh, if you're not actually participating in the crime in any in, in any way, then it just uh, it's just completely insane. Yeah, and 
you know, I, I don't even know how, where to uh, frame these kinds of policies, and we'll read uh, later on in the show another one that is uh, uh, of similar insanity in uh, in Britain. I don't even know where, where to put them. I mean, I don't think that most people who voted for this thing uh, are necessarily ideological feminists or complete idiots. It's just that there seems to be something in the... Uh, I, I don't even want to say the politician's psyche because I, so I don't think I don't even think that they have a psyche or a conscience, uh, because otherwise they wouldn't be politicians. But there has to be something in in individuals that are in parliaments and whatnot that makes them completely oblivious to uh, to the negative consequences that can come out of such policies. Yeah, I mean it, it, it's basic basically. Uh this law is a reaction to the uh, incidents in in Cologne on on New Year's Eve. Um, basically, the, the whole idea that you know something must be done, and uh, so we will pass this law. Um, never mind the fact that the actual uh, crimes that occurred in, in Cologne are, of course, uh, already covered by by the old uh, criminal law. Uh, we wouldn't actually need these these new kinds of laws to. Uh, Convict the people who are guilty. Their problem with the Cologne thing is that uh, is actually finding these specific people who committed the crimes. Uh, yeah, that that is the problem. But uh, if 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 you know who these people are and if you can have some sort of evidence, then we could all could have already com uh, convicted them uh, according to the old law. So this new law would not actually help in uh, if some sort of situation like that would be were to occur again. Mm -hmm. But it's it's you know it's. Uh, this idea that something needs to be done and we can't just uh, do nothing, so uh, why not this? Yeah, it's pretty much the result of a moral panic. Uh, now, uh, since you mentioned the Cologne attacks, I I've seen some threads of individuals complaining that uh, uh, some of the perpetrators of the Cologne attacks have been given you know, suspended sentences or things of that nature. And um, <clears throat> obviously the these kinds of... Uh, uh, results of the trials um, created some discontent amongst the members of the public, but one has to also consider the fact that uh, uh, only a tiny pr proportion of the crimes committed in the uh, New Year's Eve in Cologne were, in Cologne were actually uh, serious crimes. Most of them were let's let, let, let's put it the petty crimes, not necessarily jailworthy crimes. Yeah, most most of it was was fairly minor stuff. It was just that uh, it occurred on such a large scale that made it uh, extraordinary. Yeah, but nevertheless, I mean, there were there weren't really too many serious crimes. Those that were, of course, is are different matter. But uh, many of the trials that were already that have already been finalized by now are of the more, of the less serious uh, uh, magnitude. Yeah. You know, a lot of times, especially in sort of right-wing English-speaking media, there was people talk about the sort of a mass rape epidemic or something like that. But actually, it was just I believe uh, exactly two uh, two cases of of uh, rape being claimed in that uh, Cologne thing. Mm -hmm. So it's not not exactly a mass rape or anything like that. It just Mm -hmm. Yeah, two or three claims have been made. Not none of them proven so far, if yes. I remember correctly. So yeah, I mean, it, 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 what made it extraordinary is probably the, the scale of it. But otherwise, uh, most of the crimes committed there were, weren't really uh, that serious. Yep. Okay, let's get to the, to the next one, which I think you've picked because of the bizarrery of the story. Coming from the <laughs> Daily Mail, I mean, I mean, it, it really. I mean, if if I if I were to do, to if someone would ask me, give, give me an example of a story that is highly immoral, I'll just link to this one. Uh, <laughs> coming from the Daily Mail, I mean, it, it's really horrific. Wife fights for share of ex's one hundred and seventy-five thousand pounds payout for child abuse. Estranged partner could make legal history after arguing money is a marital asset. An estranged wife is trying to claim part of the £175,000 compensation her husband received for suffering sexual abuse as a child. As part of her divorce settlement, Helen Tippett, 41, has applied to the courts for a share of the cash paid to Andrew Kerslake. Uh, Mr. Kerslake, 45, regarded the compensation as dirty money and put it into a trust to be given to charity when he dies. But Miss Tippett claims the money is a marital asset and wants her share of it. 
it is believed legal history will be made if the courts find in her favor. Mr. Curlslake was molested when between the ages of 5 and 10 by a family friend. After he finally went to the police in 1998, his abuser was jailed for three years. The father of four was paid £175,000 by the Criminal Inquiries Compensation Authority, a government organization which pays damages to victims of violent crime in 2002. He set up the Andrew Kelslake Trust and the fund was, has grown to almost £250,000 after being invested by his lawyers. Mr. Kelslake, who has waived his right to anonymity as a victim of sexual abuse, said, quote, I was given the money to compensate for what happened to me when I was very, a very young boy. I was abused over 500 times every Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Saturday. It left me with both physical and emotional damage. I didn't apply for the money. I didn't really want it at the time but I'm not prepared to hand it over as part of our divorce settlement. It doesn't seem right that my ex-wife uh, should get a penny of it. It does not belong to her. She wasn't the one who was abused. It is shameless and immoral that she is even trying. I'm very disappointed in her." Close quote. When the compensation was paid, the couple were happily married. Miss Tippett was studying for a humanities degree, oh the irony, and Mr. Kelslake was a stay-at-home father. He said, quote, my wife wanted to spend it. She wanted a beautiful house. She had all sorts of ways of spending it. But to me, it was dirty money. I could not bring myself to use it. Devout Catholic Mr. Kelslake wants, to fund the, wants the fund to be his legacy and his laid down instructions about how it should be used to help other victims of abuse. His 19-year ma marriage came to an end four years ago and he has since become estranged from his children. His wife reverted to her maiden name and Mr. Kelslake believes she is now in a relationship with a man named Jared Williams who is 11 years her junior. Mr. Kelslake who walks uh, with the aid of crutches after breaking his back in a fall said quote, they say they are not living together but he posts pictures of the two of them in bed on Facebook. I'm concerned that some of that money would end up in his pocket. That can't be right. Mr. Kelslake said he now suffers from a variety of health problems. His legal team say that if Miss Tippett wins the case, it will be the first time compensation paid to a sex abuse victim has been part of a divorce settlement. He said, I don't want people to think I put the money in a trust to stop Helen getting her hands on it. That is not the case. I just don't want the money myself and it is my wish that it will be divided between two charities of my choice when I die. It was paid to me for something that happened long before I met Helen. I still have to live with the consequences of that. Mr. Kelslake lives alone in a housing associ association bungalow in uh, Lan uh, sorry, Lanheran near Bridget in South Wales. <clears throat> His estranged wife now works part-time in a church breakfast club and claims she needs the money to buy a house for herself and her two youngest children. Miss Tippett was accompanied by Mr. Williams at two preliminary hearings at the county court in Pontypridd. She refused to comment on her claim, which is due to be decided in September. Oh, well, what do wow. you say about that? Wow. Wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, when, when I saw this link, uh, when you sent, me, sent it to me in an email, I was like, come on, that can't be right. I mean, I, I must be reading something wrong. I mean, sorry. <laughs> you know, I, I just, it, it was still early in the morning for me, so you know, I just had another coffee. And I probably understand I'm getting this wrong, but no, I wasn't. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't even know. I mean... There is a proverb uh, around my neck of the woods that, is, that says that it is not the stupid the one who demands, it's stupid the one who accepts. So, you know, before blaming the quote-unquote estranged wife, I would blame the courts first. I mean, why would you even accept uh, a motion filed in this regard? I mean, shouldn't there be a judge like, where did he have this money? Oh, yeah, compensation for sexual abuse. Fuck off. Case dismissed. I mean, yeah. isn't that how it's supposed to work in a sane uh, uh, in a sane society? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I would be surprised if she actually wins, but um, so I mean, the, the fact that it has gone so far is uh, is not a good sign. It's doesn't not. Speak, it doesn't speak highly of the. Uh, um, British uh, judicial system that uh, it has, has been allowed to go so far. Mm -hmm. And let's not forget that the same British judiciary pretty much uh, modified the terms of um, cohabitation. That basically, if you cohabitate with the um, with any with anyone really now, given that 
uh, same-sex quote-unquote marriages are considered to be equal with normal marriages. Basically, if you cohabitate with anyone, uh, that anyone can claim after, I don't know, I think it's six months or one year, can claim actual benefits of actual marriage. And that's, of course, usually the quote-unquote estranged wife. Let's not kid ourselves. It's not like it's applied uh, equally in any way, shape, or form. So it, yeah. given these kinds of precedents and given that the way the uh, the common law system tends to work, which is the precedent is worth more than present-day common sense, uh, <clears throat> uh, given these precedents, I, will, I would not be t totally shocked if she wins. Surprised, maybe, but shocked. I, I don't. I don't think I would be. I mean, I, I kind of come to the level of cynicism to expect these kinds of things. Yeah. <sighs> I mean, it it, it it really does leave you speechless, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, it it sort of does. It, I mean, it it just uh, it's just uh, really callous and. Uh, and immoral on on this woman's part, and, uh... and uh, this individual who is now you know being dragged to court for this, he, he seems such like like a nice fellow. I mean, he says, "Well, I regard it as dirty money. I want to help other victims of sexual abuse when I die, and by the time I die, maybe the amount will be even bigger after the lawyers will take care to invest it further and grow the the trust." I mean, he he really does sound, sounds like a like a very nice fellow. Trying to do the best of uh, of the situation, and here comes the judiciary. <laughs> oh Jesus Christ! <sighs> yeah, let's go talk about that, Mrs. Alice Schwarzer. <laughs> okay, um, this one is from uh, the side. Penalty order against Alice Schwarzer. The writer had deposited royalties and speaking fees in a Swiss account without paying taxes on that money. Now she has been sentenced to a six-figure fine. The District Court of Cologne has issued a penalty order against Ali Schwarzer, according to a report by Bild am Sonntag. Quote, yes, it is true that my tax trial is over, Schwarzer told the newspaper, with a penalty order, as was to be expected. According to Bild, the fine is a low six-figure amount. In November 2013, Ali Schwarzer had made a voluntary disclosure and paid her back taxes. The prosecuting office of Kummersbach investigated and found the voluntary disclosure not to be in order. Thus, it did not absolve her of guilt. According to Bildam Sonntag, with the help of interest, Schwarzer had accumulated almost 4 million euros since the 1980s on her account with the uh, Zurich-based private bank Lienhardt and Partner. Most of the money came from royalties and speaking fees. The poor little oppressed feminist, 4 million euros, not bad. Not <laughs> bad at all. Not yeah. bad at all. Yeah, no, and this is the, the sort of ahead. little side account that she has there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, you know, just peanuts, barely surviving. Poor little thing. <laughs> On the other hand, uh, yeah, when it comes to these kinds of things, I tend to, to side with the criminal, quote-unquote criminal. I mean, I, I don't regard tax evasion as a crime, but rather as self-defense. Yeah, I don't really have a problem with that uh, um, in, in general. It's just uh, may, maybe in the case of Adi Schwarz, we can make an, ex an exception because <laughs> she's also... Um, the kind of person who hogs uh, tax uh, tax money for all sorts of her, her pet projects uh, of uh, you know various millions for some sort of uh, um, some sort of uh, a construction project in in Berlin some sort of tower with uh, it's filled with feminist literature and whatever and uh, where and that sort of supposedly is supposed to be for um, uh, sort of for the public, so that, where they can educate themselves. But uh, if if you have any sort of um, uh, sort of co sort of connections to uh, to men's rights groups, then you probably won't be allowed to actually go in there, uh, because then they, then they regard you as hostile, and uh, uh, you wouldn't want to uh, ad to admit some sort of heretic into your inner sanctum. 
Um, is it still working? Is it still open? Yeah, I think so, yes. I'll try to find it next time I'm in Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> no, What's seriously. It, I think it's Frauentum or something. I, I, I have, to, have to look it up. Well, it, uh, it's probably the only big feminist tower in the, in the town. How hard can it be? <laughs> And the, uh, the first thing I'll ask is why is it a tower? I mean, isn't it a phallic symbol or something? <laughs> 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 but yeah, I, I guess you do have a point. I mean, I'm very okay with tax evasion, uh, but as long as you know you're defending your own hard-earned cash from the institutionalized theft that is the taxation system of the government. However, when you live off the government, well, it, at least you'd better. Uh, abide by the government's rules. I mean, you abide by the uh, by the person giving you the money, uh, by the rules of the person giving you the money. In this case, the government. Yeah, and uh, um, so sort of for, for me, at least, the main reason I'm not against tax evasion is that I believe that uh, most individuals uh, use their money to much better effect. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. and do much more good with it than the government would, uh, but in the case of Adi Schwarz, I don't think that's really given. Yeah. Um, I'd, again, I'd probably, I mean, probably rather, rather have the, the uh, German state have the money than at least Schwarzer. Fair enough, fair enough, and I can't really disagree with that. Uh, but, you know, I mean, when she avoids taxes on, I don't know, the royalties of her damn books, I mean, I'm surprised that there is such thing. Uh, you know, she sells so many of them that there are, there's actually royalties. Um, but, you know, when it comes to that, I mean, at least she worked for those books and whatnot. I mean, it's her cash, and if she tries to uh, hide them from uh, from the overreaching taxman. That's fine, but uh, you know when it comes to you know salaries or remunerations for working on state-funded projects, nah, you shouldn't be able to do that. Yeah, I mean most of this money was uh, accumulated, you know, back in uh, I guess eighties and nineties and so on. When I don't, I don't think that that back that back then she was getting. Uh, these kinds of uh, tax uh, euros or tax marks, I guess. Um, yeah, you know. probably not. Probably not. I don't think the back in the days of uh, Helmut Kohl, there were so many uh, <laughs> feminist-friendly tax uh, uh, tax cash available uh, at the time. Yeah, maybe not during the, during the uh, days when Angela Merkel was a uh, women's minister. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. She was she was a minister against men, wasn't she? <laughs> yeah, this for for a while, yes. Yeah, we have a we are, uh, on the Romanian language internet. There is a there is a nude picture of her. She used to come at the Black Sea and uh, on the beach he, on, on the beach here uh, as a DDR tourist. Okay. Yeah, you can't imagine the memes that are being made. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <clears throat> Speaking of memes and uh, you know very hateful talks about women, let's get to the next one. Okay, this one is from the UK, from the Daily Mail. Wolf whistling to become a hate crime. Police force starts recording uninvited verbal engagement from men to women in the same category as racist abuse. A police force revealed today it has become Britain's first to recognize misogyny as a hate crime. Nottinghamshire Police is recording incidents such as street harassment, verbal abuse, unwanted physical approaches, and taking photographs without consent within the hate crime definition. It also includes mo uh, using mobile phones to send unwanted messages, unwanted sexual advances, and unwanted or uninvited physical or verbal contact or engagement, possibly including wolf whistling. The force's chief constable, Sue Fish, said, I'm delighted that we are leading the way towards tackling misogyny in all its forms. It is a very important aspect of the overall hate crime work being conducted and one that will take Nottinghamshire a sa uh, that will make Nottinghamshire a safer place for all women. What women face often on a daily basis is absolutely unacceptable and can be extremely distressing. Nottinghamshire police is committed to, to taking misogynistic hate crime seriously. The force has spent three months training officers and staff on misogyny hate crime and said it covers incidents against women that are motivated by an attitude of a man towards a woman. Police who have been working with Nottingham Women's Centre on, uh, on the subject added that the crime includes 
behavior targeted towards a woman by men simply because they are a woman. The NWC Centre Manager, Melanie Chef, said, We're pleased to see Nottinghamshire Police recognize the breadth of violence and intimidation that women experience on a daily basis in our communities. Understanding this as a hate crime will help people to see the seriousness of these incidents and hopefully encourage more women to come forward and report offenses. A force spokesman said, Unwanted physical or verbal contact or engagement is defined as exactly that and we can cover wolf whistling and other similar types of contact. If the victim feels that this has happened because they are a woman, then we will record it as a hate crime. This doesn't necessarily mean that a criminal offence has been committed, but means we will carry out risk assessments and offer support as we would to any victim of a hate crime. Hate crime is a te terminology used to record all incidents and crimes with the, which the victim perceives to be motivated by prejudice. We take all reports of hate crimes extremely seriously. The spokesman added, domestic abuse is not included within the scope of misogyny hate crime in this procedure as it is dealt with comprehensively within its own procedure. In April, Poppy Smart, 23, reported a group of builders to, to West Mercia Police for wolf whistling at her on a way, uh, at her on a, on a way to work in, in Worcester. The four said it was a matter for the men's employers. And last September, BBC reporter Sarah Teal had uh, sexual obscenities shot at her by a passing man but you filmed a news report about sexual harassment in Nottingham City Centre. Oh boy. What a cunt. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it, it's interesting. I mean, we're going to record it as a hate crime if the quote-unquote victim feels that this has happened, and then, but that doesn't necessarily mean that a criminal offence has been committed. Which, in other words, it will mean that the next, um, I don't know, next years or maybe two years from now, the uh, quote-unquote hate crime national report statistics or things like that will broadly consist of incidents that aren't even crimes in the eyes of the law, but will be used to forward narratives about how dangerous the society is or things of that nature. Yeah, and maybe once you have that, we can have a have a campaign where we see that, uh, you know, in uh, 95% of, uh, of hate crime incidents uh, uh, are not even, even legal under British law, so therefore, of course, you have to change the law to uh, cover all these yep. kinds of crimes. Yep, yep, basically, yep. Uh, and, and since uh, there is no even uh, a remote semblance of objective assessment, just that, you know, the quote-unquote victim feels that this has happened, uh, <sighs> That, that can create a, a, an astonishingly high wave of, uh, of basically over-reporting. And if, uh, uh, heaven forbid, this would lead to a change in law, it, it would eventually increase the level of lawlessness. Because if nobody knows what the law is, then what is the purpose of it? Yeah, then the, basically the, then, then the police can just sort of arbitrarily charge anyone with a crime. Mm -hmm. Pretty much, pretty much, yeah. And uh, I, I guess the, the, those who support these kinds of things, because uh, surpri as surprising as it may sound, there are uh, loads of individuals across Europe and, of course, across Britain too, who genuinely believe that uh, such thing as hate speech or hate crime actually exists, which in reality they don't. Um, these kinds of people will finally realize how misguided they are when they'll start being charged themselves with these ridiculous things, with, with these ridiculous uh, quote unquote crimes. Yeah, I, I just think that this whole idea of, of hate crime is just, uh, it's, just an, it's just absurd. I mean, uh, s say you, um, I don't know, uh, punch someone in the face because uh, he's black, for example. Um, that's supposedly a hate crime. But why do you have to have this extra category of, of hate crime? It is already a crime to punch people in the face, you know, unless it's yeah. self-defense. Um, why do we have to have this extra level? Why, why, why does it matter why he punches you in the face? Does it hurt more to be punched in the face by a racist than by a non-racist? Uh, yeah. What, what is the purpose here? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. And uh, uh, I can understand to be interested in the, in the motives, you know, to establish... Uh, aggravated conditions versus less aggravated conditions, but 
to establish whether it was for political reasons or not, I don't know how relevant that is for establishing eventual guilt. Yeah, why why is it worse to be say punched in the face by uh, by by someone for belonging to some sort of group like a racial group for example than to be punched in the face because uh, the person across from me is just uh, is just a dick or he just mm -hmm. doesn't like the way your face looks or uh, mm -hmm. he doesn't like you personally for whatever reason why, mm -hmm. why is why is that first uh, station so much worse I just I just don't get it. Yeah, me neither, and uh, I have yet to find someone who can at least explain to me what the thought process is, uh, other than, you know, using the usual Tumblrina language, like, you know, the, the systemic oppression and whatnot, uh, which doesn't really work that much. I mean, in, in the real world, let's uh, stick to Britain, because this is a situation in Britain, uh, the, the, it, it's usually, if, if for instance, if it's a racist thing, it, it's usually a white working class dude punching a black working class dude. <laughs> so I don't know where where the systemic oppression comes into that because they're usually both uh, poor as fuck and disadvantaged as fuck anyway. As, uh, so the lefties will uh, will have to at least come up with better reasons to in introduce these kinds of policies, because for now the the official reasons just don't uh, can't, don't cut the mustard. Yeah, it's also something that is uh, extremely hard to prove. Like, how how do you prove what someone's uh, motivation go. was? Why, why? How do you know that uh, you know he, that he was punched in the face because he was black? Maybe it was for some other reason. Maybe it, it's just pretty much impossible to to establish that. Uh, uh, and that that that's that's a really dangerous thing to have when. Uh, some sort of uh, unprovable motivation uh, very much uh, changes the the severity of a particular crime. Yeah, and you know, uh, at least in Europe, we uh, in the Roman law there used to be that that concept called called mens rea, which is basically the state of the mind, either of the perpetrator or, or of the victim. And one of the reasons that uh, rape, for instance, is a very hard to prosecute crime is because it is a crime that depends on the state of the mind, usually, of the victim. And this, uh, for the last 2,000 years of, I don't know, European slash Western law, we tried as hard as we could to make laws that are applicable without having to concern ourselves with the state of the mind of the perpetrator, because that includes, that tends to bring in <clears throat> a higher le level of relativism within prosecution. So we, when we finally achieve that through technology most of the time, you know, there's DNA evidence, there's this and that, that can reduce as to a much higher extent the level of relativism than there used to be 150 or 200 years ago. Uh, when we finally achieved some of that, now we're coming back to that? I mean, and that's supposed to be progress? Uh. Yeah, and also it, it just seems to me to be just... Uh, Fundamentally unjust. Like, uh, yep. The, the point of, of of crime, to me at least, is to to protect people from being victimized. And uh, the reason they're being victimized just isn't doesn't really answer into it. Why, why does it matter? Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm mhm. I mean, un un unless the reason is something like, uh, you know, he punched me in the face first, something like that, uh, or. Uh, Maybe if if uh, if you're being extremely provoked or something like that, that could that could be uh, some sort of um, ameliorating mm -hmm. circumstances, something like that. But uh, mm -hmm. what is it called ex ex mitigating. I forget. mitigating circumstances, right, right. Um, but uh, whether you're punching someone in the face because uh, he's black or because she's a woman or because uh, uh, you just don't like his face or uh, he's uh, uh, jeering on the wrong football team or whatever, uh, mm -hmm. I don't. I just don't really see why why that's uh, all that important. Yeah, and how does that change the actual outcome, which is someone has been punched in the face? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I completely agree. I don't really understand the mindset, and every time I try to ask around, it was either just because or some um, contorted. A narrative about systemic oppression, and whenever there's that, I already said it's basically okay, fine, but it's usually two working class dudes that that do this. Uh, what then? Where is the systemic oppression there? 
and that's when usually the conversation ended. So I really don't know uh, <laughs> what what the mindset is. Uh, if there's any leftist listening to this, can you please enlighten us? The, you can find easily my email. Please enlighten me uh, how, the, how these things work. I promise to read the email out loud, no matter how much I disagree with it. Uh, yeah, if, if, if at least it makes me understand, please. If I might offer a theory, what I what I think it boils down to is that uh, a lot of people just uh, really, really hate uh, racism and uh, sexism and uh, all these kinds of isms, um, and they would really like it like to make it illegal. But we we don't really um, we don't really like uh, the idea of of thought crime. So you can't of course, just outright make it illegal to be a racist or a sexist or whatever. Or homophobic, or something like that. Um, so, in, so instead, we just connect it to some actual crime that everyone agrees is a crime, and um, then that combination makes it much, much worse. And um, so, so then we, we punish these particular crimes, we label them hate crimes, and we punish them more harshly, as sort of a way of uh, of of sort of of, of of uh, expressing our disgust, our hatred for racist, sexist, homophobes, and so on. Um, so it's basically mental masturbation. That's what I'm trying to say. Something like that. Something like that. It's basically a sort of a um, a purity thing. That uh, um, this idea that uh, having these kinds of bigoted opinions is. Uh, Impure, impure. It is uh, pollution. It has to be excised somehow. And um, so, if if we if we do bad things to uh, to these impure individuals, that's not 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 a problem. We can uh, punish them as harshly as as possible uh, because they are sick, disgusted fox, and uh, they don't deserve our compassion and. Uh, uh, they're basically just uh, fundamentally bad people, mm -hmm. and so it's 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 all right if we punish them uh, much more harshly than than would usually. Mm -hmm. But but you know they 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 they, they can't quite uh, get to the level where um, these thoughts uh, are already in and of themselves uh, a crime, because that would be you know impossible to prove and uh, uh, extremely Orwellian and so on. Um, but at least they have this sort of uh, category of hate crimes and, of course, hate speech, very importantly. Um. Yeah, that, that could explain. I mean, uh, and, and probably you, you'll be hard-pressed to find the leftist articulated in these words. <laughs> yeah, it's not a very flattering explanation. <laughs> it, it's, it's not, but it, it may actually be more, much more closer to the actual thought process that goes in because... We all know that in most cases, uh, individuals make a decision and then uh, come up with a reason to support that decision. So they might actually <clears throat> reaching to this conclusion through a similar thought process that you describe, and then oh my God, I can't describe it honestly because that that would be awful. So let's describe it somehow else, in a different fashion. Yep, seems legit. <laughs> okay, oh my god, we've been very efficient. Okay, let's get to the last one. Okay, the last one is from Austria, from uh, the local.at. Austria rules the face veil ban at work is not discriminatory. One of Austria's highest courts has ruled that companies who ban the wearing of face veils are not discriminating against their employees. The case heard by the Supreme Court concerns a Muslim woman who was dismissed from her job after she told her bosses she wanted to wear a full face veil in the future. The woman, who already wore a headscarf and overgarment known as Abaya, also said her company discriminated against her uh, while being assigned work tasks due to her religious dress. She also accused her boss of making discriminatory comments, including saying she was carrying out an experiment in ethnic clothing. The first court recognized the case was likely discriminatory but did not make a legal judgment after being further clarif uh, after deciding further clarification was needed and passing it up to a higher court. The Supreme Court, the OGH, agreed that the woman was probably discriminated against when it came to being given duties at work 
which was further worsened by the comments from her boss. When it came to wearing a face veil, however, the court ruled that employer uh, was allowed to ban them if they prevent communication and interaction between employers, employees and clients. In its ruling, the court said leaving the face uncovered is one of the undisputed basic rules of communication in Austria. They concluded that the stubborn refusal to comply with her employer's rules meant it was not discriminatory to dismiss the woman from the job. The woman was awa awarded uh, 1,200 of the 7,000 euros compensation she was seeking. 7,000 euros? Uh, for what? For not being allowed, uh, for, for being told that you're conducting an experiment, with, which was obviously the case. Uh, and for not being allowed uh, ninja clothing, where that's not necessarily uh, nece not, not not necessarily useful or relevant, uh, you know, uh, these kinds of things. And these, the more I hear about these kinds of judgments, and I'm, I'm starting to think that maybe I could make some extra shekels by uh, living one month a year somewhere in one of these cucked uh, nations like France or Austria. Uh, you know, and identify as a Muslim woman, and then whenever <laughs> I'm being told uh, the proverbial "fuck off," which is obviously completely deserved, uh, you know, just sue them and ask for compensation from the cucked state. <laughs> I'm uh, a trans Muslim. Yeah, I'm a trans Muslim. I could be a trans Muslim for a month. I mean, I, I would just have a lot of fun and get a lot of shekels at the end of it. Uh, why not? <laughs> and I have a direct train from my city to Vienna, so it wouldn't be <laughs> that difficult. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, joke aside, uh, uh, seriously, why is this worthy of a compensation to begin with? Serious question. I, who was actually being harmed? And uh, since when is there an unalienable right to impose your culture upon someone else's culture on that someone else's property? Um, yeah, well, in Austria they have these uh, anti-discrimination laws and uh, all sorts of um, labor legislation about uh, you know when you can actually fire someone and you actually have to have uh, a particular reason and it has to be one of the accepted reasons. So I guess she she, she sued for um, uh, unjust dismissal and uh, that was that was, was the what the seven thousand were for. Um, yeah, I mean, if if the worst comment he made is that she was conducting an experiment in ethnic clothing, that then it can't be really that bad. I mean, <laughs> it's not exactly the worst kind of harassment imaginable. Yeah, and given how the situation eventually did turn out, it, uh, the boss was maybe correct. I mean, it, this does sound like an experiment to me. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm not sure what. Uh, uh, what kind of work this woman was doing, but uh, especially if it's some sort of customer-facing work, then uh, um, wearing a, a full a full veil and basically dressing up like a ninja is just not uh, very conducive to uh, having good relationship with your customers. Especially if it's front office, but even if it's not, uh, you know, front office and working directly with the customer. Um, <clears throat> You know, if, if if you're, for instance, in a warehouse, uh, carrying things with an abaya, because uh, you know this article doesn't say, but abaya is not just about covering the face; it's about covering everything. It's abaya is the mandatory suit that you will find in all women in public spaces in Saudi Arabia, and it uh, covers from the tip of the head to the tip of the toes. So you know, doing most of the things that you would expect uh, in most positions is almost impossible. I mean, the only thing that you could actually do with an abaya is being a call center worker. Everything else would be quite inconvenient to do uh, with an abaya. It's just the way it is. Yeah, and uh, I, I mean, well, the, I, I don't really see how how the court, the court determined that uh, uh, she was actually being discriminated against in the uh, kind of work she was given and uh, 
it, it just seems that the sort of thing that is very hard to prove. So I, I'd be curious to know how they actually, um, what, what actual evidence they have of that. Yeah, <laughs> and again, I, it just seems to me that it, it, it is an attempt to, uh, you know, obviously the judges understood that the complaint itself was uh, quite ridiculous to begin with, so they tried this contorted thing that, uh, well, it is uh, one of the basic communication rules or uh, basic rule, undisputed basic rules of communication in Austria. So basically, they pulled out, of, well, it's our culture, bitch. <laughs> Uh, so they they tried basically to to fit in a uh, a square in a in a round hole. Uh, when all of these things would cease to exist, if the if idiotic laws would cease to exist, like laws that dictate that allow the state dictate when uh, when I can lay off uh, workers and what and when I can't. Yeah, it would be much easier if it just. Uh if employers can just arbitrarily decide who to hire and who to fire. Which um, they can anyway, most of the time. You know, they, they, they yeah, just usually they can, you just have to get come up with some sort of convoluted reason for that. Yeah, they have and to come up with something that sounds politically correct. I mean, let, let's face it, if I want to fire someone because he or she is a Muslim, I can do it in almost every EU country without any problem. I just have to pay some extra shekel to a lawyer to come up with a letter of motivation that uh, fits the legal template. That's it. Yeah, and it, that's just a, the sort of thing that makes everything a lot more complicated for everyone involved. Um, I guess the only people who benefit are the lawyers. The lawyers, absolutely. And you know, whenever I say this, that you know, uh, we should get back to a higher and fire standard, uh, and it doesn't really matter. Everyone should be allowed to fire anyone else. Uh, for whatever reason, that oh my god, but that would, bigotry would l run rampant. Well, maybe, maybe not. After all, isn't it better to know who the big, who the real bigots are? Because right now we're prevented from knowing which employers are bigoted and who aren't, because you know they have to somehow uh, <clears throat> mask it in some way, shape, or form. But if it's you know completely open, you yes, you would have incidences of individuals being fired for whatever because they're black or because they're Muslims and whatnot. But at least you would know up front who the bigots are and who aren't. And the whole situation would rearrange itself much faster and on, on much more honest uh, uh, pillars, basically. Yeah, and also, I mean, certainly there are probably some, some bigoted employers, but uh, the vast majority of, of them are not, or at least not bigoted in, in, in a particular way. Um, so even if, if say, you know, 10 or 20 percent of employers uh, hate Muslims and they just uh, discriminate against them, um, then you, and that, that, that's just a sort of slight impediment to, to, to finding a job. And um, these you know, 10 or 20 percent, they can already um, mostly stop Muslims from working for them. Mm -hmm. um, by just, uh, just uh, they just reject them for other reasons. Uh, it's just uh, you know, they just uh, don't quite fit in with the team or whatever it is, uh, or don't fulfill some sort of particular qualification. Um, and you know, if, I mean, even even if uh, due to these laws, a uh, an uh, anti-Muslim employer is pressured into hiring some Muslims. Um, do you really want to actually work for someone who hates you? You yeah. presumably you, you, will, you will then be treated uh, worse than other employees. Do you actually want that? W wouldn't it just be um, much much easier just just in front uh, just uh, know right away that uh, um, this person hates Muslims, so probably I shouldn't bother. Um, pursuing a job here because I'm not going to advance anyway. I'm not going to get, to get uh, uh, promotions and raises and so on. Um, mm -hmm. But if 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 everything is hush hush and you don't actually know that uh, that you're not being promoted uh, or you're not giving the the kind of jobs you want uh, because you're Muslim, mm -hmm. and uh, then maybe you you end up working for for an employer who actually hates you um, for years without even realizing that. Uh, reason you're not advancing is not because uh, 
you're doing a job right, but just uh, because of bigotry. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Maybe it's just on the, the long run. Yeah, on the long run, these kinds of policies actually uh, harm even those allegedly helped by them. Yeah. All yeah. right. Uh, before we go off, Minjin keeps on bothering me uh, on saying things about the conference, uh, but I, I don't really know what to say. I mean, I asked him to be more specific, and he's like, well, you're on the other side of the planet. Like, what the fuck do I know? <laughs> uh, uh, I, I don't know. I don't even know what to say about the, the, the conference. Uh, were there protests? No, there were no protesters. I said that at the beginning. I guess you missed it. Um, security was great. And even if someone did try to protest, uh, probably the security stopped them long before uh, reaching the, mm, the venue where actual attendees and delegates were uh, sitting most of the time. Uh, but, uh, you know, in a way, it's, it, it, it's a bit disappointing. The poor Steve Brule was the most disappointed of all. I mean, he flew all the way <laughs> from Canada with all his video equipment and professional my big microphones and whatnot just to get a few protest uh, video uh, so a few protest footage and uh, eventually he didn't all he and did was some hard some half assed interviews with us on the balcony Please. yeah and there, w there wasn't even a little tiny red yeah not even a little tiny red yeah and I, I also regretted that I forgot to transfer the, the images on my laptop. Uh, I had a few new images with the uh, Jess Phillips MP photoshopped as Big Red, and I wanted to take them with me and project them during my presentation, and I forgot. I simply forgot to transfer them from my computer to my laptop that I had with me in London. So I basically everyone missed out on that. <laughs> but at least we had the, we had an actual MP at the conference, uh, Philip Davis uh, from the Conservatives. Uh, and he had a very, very good pres presentation, very down-to-earth, pragmatic uh, uh, presentation about how to actually change hearts and minds within the political establishment. And that's not something that you, you would expect at, uh, at, at such a conference. I mean, think about it this way. When, when, when I started this show uh, three years and a half ago, uh, I wasn't expecting that you know there would be actual conferences where members of the parliament would come to speak with men's rights activists. Yeah, we definitely have come a long way, haven't we? Yeah, we did. We did, and uh, most of the most of the people uh, that was particularly remarkable compared to and everyone will see. By the way, all the presentations will be uploaded on uh, uh, on J4MB's channel or Mike Buchanan's channel on YouTube. Uh, he promised that by within a week after the conference ends, uh, he'll start uploading uh, one by one uh, in the order that uh, in which they were actually held. So um, I guess everyone will have to wait for that. But uh, you know, uh, as opposed to the 2014 Detroit conference, there was very little overlap. I mean, every single speaker had an almost entirely different area that was covered. Uh, so in, in that regard, it was. Uh, um, I hate to put it this way, but it was very, very non-boring. I mean, even if you knew all of the things in advance, uh, you could still find out find out new things. I mean, there, there was a chap who's involved in uh, um, with, with, with the forensic cr criminology. I forget his name, uh, but basically, he started explaining how uh, uh, anti-male bias works in the. Uh, in forensic uh, uh, analysis and uh, how technology has started to mitigate that quite a lot and basically start he didn't start it from the premise that oh my god there is institutionalized misandry or something no 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 he started well there is one and here's how technology is helping us and here's how things have gotten better and here's how things can get even better if this if A B C D and D uh, so you know, it would, these kinds of presentations were extremely refreshing. Because it uh, f uh, because it, it it does something that I was hoping that it would happen, it basically move uh, move the whole thing into a very um, pragmatic way of putting things, as opposed to a emotional way of putting things. I don't know how to describe it better than that. Yeah, it sounds very interesting, and uh, definitely look forward to uh, watching some of these videos. Oh, when they come uh, out. 
one by one they'll start up uh, being uh, on the uh, G4MB's channel and of course on a Voice for Men. So uh, basically, just everyone should start following VoiceForMen.com for roughly five days from now. It should be the first one to be published. That is if uh, Mr. Buchanan holds on to the schedule and doesn't appear as something that will delay the things a little bit. Uh, the uh, the, the the other nice part that it was that uh, Mrs. Erin Pitsy stayed for the whole conference and was able to. It, she, she's a, a lot more open than uh, than than, uh, than I could imagine. And she, uh, open how? Uh, in, in the sense that she, uh, she'll uh, st stick around with the conversation for three hours and you would not even notice it, and go into very very great details that you'll never hear from her in public because well because reasons. <laughs> Like details yeah. when she first started the the Chizik, um, uh battered women's shelter, or details about who exactly uh, tried to stop her from building a similar world for men in the 70s and whatnot. These are the kinds of details mm -hmm. that you'll never find in history books. Yep. So yeah, in in, in that regard, well, it, it was great. Now uh, another aspect that was great was that we had a very limited amount of. Uh, how should I describe them? Disturbed individuals, maybe? Uh, I don't want to use the word insane, because that would be a bit too extremist, even by my standard. <clears throat> I mean, you, when you have uh, an alternative school of thought, regardless of whether it's non-feminism or uh, I don't, whatever, everything that is slightly outside or on the edge of the Overton window, it is pretty much expected to have some individuals that are a little bit weird. Uh, that didn't happen, and I was quite quite surprised that that didn't happen. Yeah, I mean, uh, f for a lot of people, um, they don't arrive at uh, at sort of non-mainstream opinion from uh, rational thought, but just from some sort of um, maybe contrarian nature that, uh, or some sort of. Um, dislike for authority and uh, this sort of inclination leads them to uh, to unusual views like uh, support for for the men's rights movement uh, mm -hmm. and then they're also more likely to believe in things like uh, Bigfoot and uh, conspiracy, the conspiracy theories and uh, all sorts of uh, alternative medicine uh, quackery and uh, whatnot. Mm -hmm. So that's definitely the sort of uh, Contrarian cluster where people there's people who believe all sorts of weird things, and often not for very good reasons. Yeah, in this particular conference, I think I have identified 1.5 individuals. That is to say, two, but the second one wasn't really that far gone. Uh, who were indeed uh, in the pattern that you described. Otherwise, no, and you know the way I can be quite sure of this assessment is because uh, in in all the breaks and all the socialization periods, I I tested with the uh, with these kinds of things, you know, calling 9/11 uh, truthery as being absolute factardery and things like that, and nobody was got triggered by that. I mean, everyone was like, yeah, <laughs> that, that that is factardery to me. <laughs> so uh, so. You, Given how offensive I tried to be in order to to see if there is a quakery, as you put it, there was a very little amount of that, much smaller than I expected. I expected a lot a lot more individuals to be like that. I was pleasantly surprised by this. Yeah, sounds good. On the other hand, you know the the guy who had the the presentation about male genital mutilation, Mr. Hammond. Um, in one of the breaks, he was like, uh, I never realized that some of the things are really that bad. I mean, in a way, thank goodness, I'm gay. Uh, so uh, you know, there, were, there were a few uh, these, a few of these kinds of moments when you're like, holy shit. <laughs> uh, I mean, when, when, you get, when you get an old guy who, you know, he's been around when um, being non-straight in the United Kingdom wasn't really as fluffy as it is now. Uh, to come actually a crime. Yeah, and to come up with and say, well, thank goodness I'm gay, after all. Uh, that's a bit disheartening. 
But other than that, things were a lot happier and a lot less depressing than I expected in most aspects. Yep, sounds good. Yeah, uh, Minjin also asks, uh, how was your meetings with the other MREs? Again, most of <laughs> the time I've spent it with Karen uh, for obvious reasons. We were the two chain smokers uh, at the venue. Uh, so we basically uh, spent a lot of time. Now, I, I wouldn't dare speak in public about the things that I spoke with Karen. <laughs> but let's just say that some of them are better to, you know, what, what happens in London stays in London. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, other than that, I had, a, I had quite a few people whom uh, I've seen commenting for years and years and years, including in my articles and my videos and whatnot, just uh, all of a sudden, uh, you know, ch chasing me around the venue, and I was like, uh, well, uh, hello, I'm this, and, you know, just saying the, the, the nickname or whatnot, if, uh, because, you know, some, some of them still remain anonymous to this very day, and uh, it, it was a little bit... Uh, surprising to me, you know, apparently I was the only one surprised by this, but it was a little bit surprising to me to just, you know, have random people come up to me and say, I've been following your work since 2011, very, very good work, uh, or, you know, just asking pointed philosophical questions about something that I wrote four years ago, and <laughs> it, it, it took me uh, several minutes just to remember, wait, wait a minute, where, when did I write that, and where, and why? <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, I didn't expect that there are such individuals out there. You know. Yeah, it's. Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, if 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 you are someone who's uh, followed these kinds of things uh, for a long time, and then there's an event near you, then of course it's uh, quite nice to actually go there and meet these people that you've been following in person. Mhm. Mm yeah, but I didn't expect it because, you know, some of the t sometimes, well, especially with this show, I mean, when we do it it, it, it it feels a little bit, like, pointless. And then all of a sudden you have, like, a hundred people who come in uh, one at a time in, in the course of six days, coming and say, well, I've been listening to your show for three years now. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very good thing. Please do it. Please continue to do it. Don't stop. Uh, it, it, it is quite, a, quite a, a pleasant surprise, but a surprise nonetheless. Yep. Yeah. I don't know what else to say. I mean, ask me anything, I guess. Uh, uh, on Monday, uh, me and Paul will have a, uh, a show uh, on this channel, on the Race for Men channel, uh, and we'll talk a bit more about the conference. So there's that. If anyone in the chat can't find the, to can't uh, ask a question now, you can ask it then, I guess. Monday, I think, on uh, 4, 4 p.m. Eastern European time, so 2 p.m. Britain time, 3 p.m. Central European. Okay. Then I guess, okay. Then I guess that's pretty much it. If there's not, mm, there aren't any further questions, uh, I guess you have an announcement. I have an announcement? Yes, you do. You I do, I do, it. yes. Uh, the usual announcement, which is to uh, take the red pill and goodbye, everyone. Take the red pill. See you next week. <laughs>